All right, so in this presentation, we're going to talk about how the Robonauts competed events. There's a lot of stuff in here that you probably shouldn't do. You know, we are pretty extreme as far as the amount of resources we put into competing, especially if you're a, you know, first, second, third, fourth year team. Um, but a lot of things we do, uh, you know, you may say, oh, I want to do that. I don't want to do that. I do want to do this. Uh, I'll point out the stuff that I really do recommend all teams doing. But yeah, go ahead and get started. Uh, about me, I'm Ryan Stockton. I'm a robotics specialist for SNK Engineering and Research at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Uh, I was a student on the Robonauts for two years, 2016 and 2017, and I've been a mentor since. Uh, I also co-lead the Robonauts Everybot program with Ethan Reed and also contribute to the NASA Robotics Alliance Project Design Guide. If you haven't seen that, it's on robotics.nasa.gov. It's a pretty cool document on, it's got a bunch of stuff, mechanical design, electrical, software. Software stuff's probably a little bit out of date right now. Uh, about the Robonauts, the Robonauts were founded in 1997 in Houston, Texas as a partnership between the Johnson Space Center and Clear Creek ISD. Uh, so we've been around for a little bit. Uh, we have 66 students this past year and about 15 mentors, about eight or core mentors who are there every day and the rest come and go whenever they can. And our program pulls from six schools from across the district and we do have two FRC teams. In 2020, we started our sister team CHIPS 324. And as a part of this whole program, we also have two best teams, 45 VRC teams and over 120 VEX IQ teams that we support. Uh, so we kind of live by the philosophy of 80-80-80. We think that going into your first event to be successful, you have to have a robot at an 80% level, your strategy at an 80% level, and execution at an 80% level. If you have the world's best robot, if you have 254-2018, and you don't have any driver experience, you're going to get beat in some matches. You're not going to find success on the field. And same thing with the strategy. If you don't really know how to play the game, you're, you don't understand the ranking point system and how all that works, you're also not going to be successful. So we need to be 80-80-80 uh, going into our first event, and we go up from there. So we think that to be an alliance captain at state champs, world champs, so we have to be at the 95 or greater level in all three categories. Sometimes, you know, we may have a weak robot, and we can make up for it a little bit at some events with the strategy and the execution. But generally, you got to have to be pretty strong in all three of those categories. The other thing, which is the name of this presentation, is uh, one match at a time. So we do not allow anyone on our drive team, anyone who has to perform at the event, the pit crew, to know who our alliance partners are going to be, who our opponents are, what our rankings are, any outcomes of the match. So this is like a this is a psychological thing, where we're going to play every match the same. It doesn't really matter if we're against 254, 2056, and 111 in a match at championships. We're going to play it the same as any other match, um, and. We have sometimes failed at this. So uh, at Space City this year, we were all, you know, we're like, oh, it's, a, it's our third district event, fourth event overall. We've got this. You know, we got state champs the next week. And a lot of the team members, and myself included, we were focused on state. We were at the event already talking about what we're going to do, prepare for the state championship, all this other stuff. And, you know, we lost focus and we ended up losing that event um, due to just an execution mistake in the, the finals. We didn't get. Uh, us, our alliance partner, who happened to be our sister team, Chips, up onto the charge station, and we lost to um, 231, who awesome house team in Houston. Wouldn't uh, want to lose to anyone other than them. They're awesome. So uh, it, you know, it was a it was a wake up call for us. And we went to state champs. We're like, we have to be focused. And we found out we're in this division with 3310, 148. Everybody's in this division, and. We're like uh, we didn't let it we didn't let it get to ourselves, and we focused on just you know play the mat play the event one match at a time, and we ended up seating first in the division, um, winning the state championship, winning the division, and uh, you know we were like okay we're we're really double downing on this and carry that into world champs as well. This has always been a philosophy of the team, but we kind of let it slip, especially um, over the turnover we've had over the last few years. We just haven't focused on this, but um, yeah, we really believe really strongly in it. So. Uh, even our, our drive coach, our drive coach doesn't look at the rankings, any of that. Uh, he's delivered a strategy by our strategist to, so our strategists and our scouters in the stands, they, they understand what's going on. They are able to look at all these things, but they're focused on delivering us a strategy to win every match, regardless of who we're with or who we're against. Uh, so we'll kind of talk about what we do pre-event. So for scouting, scouting is critical to the event success. You have to have, and this is one of the things that I think every team should have to have a uh, culture that values scouting. Scouting can't be seen as busy work. It, it's super valuable to the event and getting all accurate data. If you have everyone who loves scouting, but they just make up numbers, it doesn't really help you. 
So uh, every student on our team is trained to scout. Most of our mentors know how to scout as well. And that also includes our drivers, who in this past year actually did scout some matches. Uh, we create a scouting sheet uh, early, and we revise it. We use it by uh, watching week zero events. And if we're not competing in a week one, we'll watch week one events. And our, we have a whole scouting crew at our facility that will sit there on a Saturday. You know, people are working on the robot, but they're focused on scouting. They're testing out our scouting sheet, making sure our data system uh, works well. And we do scout on paper. Most teams don't do that anymore. Uh, we like to have a visual when we go lay out all these sheets in front of the drive team. And they can see, oh, this is where they drive. They're driving these lanes, things like that, which is possible to collect on tablet-based scouting systems. We just, we just don't do that. Um, uh, we do have people who input all that data uh, after the match into computers. So we do have a computerized scouting system that we collect all the data in. We use it for analysis. We do match predictions, things like that. And then we will hand that to our, our flight crew. Uh, I recommend having an offline scouting system. Some teams will have scouting systems that rely on the internet, which is not super reliable at a lot of the venues. Um, so you can't, it's not great to be relying on that. Um, and then we also pre-scout teams at the events we're going to. So. If a team has competed an event, we will watch their match video, usually three or four matches per team, watch it like 2x speed on YouTube, makes things go faster, and we'll do the whole scouting sheets, collect all the data. So going into an event, you know, we're going into match one, if there's only been one round of practice matches at a district event, we have some data to go off of on what these teams can actually do. Uh, for the flight crew, uh, we pick drivers based on how well they represent the team alongside uh, their driver skill, but how they represent the team is, is the number one uh, criteria. We'll do preseason tryouts. We have these gear running robots. We got a bunch of gears from Andy Mark a few years ago, and we built robots specifically for driver training. We thought it was a perfect game piece, pick and place. It, it um, is really good at training drivers without having to have shooters and calibration and all that stuff. So we, we use those. We try to narrow down to four to six drivers going into the season. So anyone can try out on the team, no matter if they're a rookie, whatever, because a lot of our students will be coming to us with literally six years of robotics experience as a freshman. So, you know, if, they, if they're really good at driving as a freshman, we'll consider them uh, for a driver. We haven't had that yet, but I know 1678's done that as well. Uh, so we also have to have all of our drivers attend every event. So they ha if they can't make an event and they can't commit to all the events, then we will not select them as a driver. Uh, we do have backup drivers who are there for you know, sickness, whatever, family emergency. So usually two of those four to six will be the competition drivers, two will be the backup drivers. And throughout the build season, they'll practice using uh, old drive bases with prototypes on them. Maybe it's a prototype intake. Maybe it's a fully integrated robot. Usually we don't get to that level of uh, prototyping where we have a whole integrated robot before um, we build our competition robots, but um, anything you have that is relevant to that year to pick up, if it's all it is is picking up a ball and spitting it across the field, you know, that's that's something that's useful for driving. Uh, they're also uh, critical in refining the control scheme of the robot. So we use this X keys button pad that's configurable and we change it literally between every event. Uh, and they drive with two PlayStation controllers. So they'll say, oh, I want this button there, this button there. Um, so we, we feed that to our software crew. They update things. And also autonomy. Sometimes we'll have, oh, we want a color sensor so we don't, the drivers don't have to know what color ball we picked up, like in 2022. Or um, we'll put a camera or something else in our intake to know if we picked up a cone this year. So they provide a lot of feedback on that in the design of the robot, especially those drivers who have driven before and also throughout the, the practice time that they get early in the season and throughout the competition season. And practice, practice, practice. Uh, it's it's the easiest way to get better and perform better at an event is have drivers who have a lot of experience driving. If all it is is on carpet that you roll out, that's that's worth a lot. If if you you can only build the wooden field elements, do that. If you only have half a field, that's way more valuable than just saying, oh, we'll figure it out when we get to the event. Uh, we write down the number of practice cycles from every single match we practice. We do it on our the glass of our driver station, write on a whiteboard something, some way to record all that data. And we also record any robot issues. Corsetto talked about this in his talk as well. Um, any issues that come up in a practice match, we need to know about them because they're probably going to come back. If we don't fix it, it's just going to come back up in a competition match, and we don't really want that to happen. And then we also select our drive coach, who in the past has been Mason Marquis, Justin Ridley. Currently, it's Ethan Reed. Uh, they have to be an expert in strategy. 
they probably have watched more. Ethan's probably watched more match video than anyone in the world, but uh, they have. We really want them to be an expert in match strategy. And uh, the last thing is that the human player also should be practicing. And you don't even need a full field for that. This year was really critical, especially with our robot design, that our human player had to get really, really good at throwing these cones halfway down the field, and uh, for us to pick them up. So that uh, is also a critical part of the flight crew. Uh, pit crew, they built, we try to build the robot in the pit at our facility, especially the competition robots. Um, they're responsible for packing the pit. They're responsible for stocking it with all our consumables and things that we help give out to other teams. Bumper wood, when we're building bumpers for other teams as well. And they also maintain the robot issues log. We have a Excel spreadsheet that's just like, that tracks all of our robot issues. And have we fixed it? Have we not? How many times has it come up? Is it just some weird bug that, or is it a recurring issue? Um, so now we go on to at the event. Uh, these are all of our competition roles. The ones in red are mentors usually, uh, but we have two drivers, the pilot and co-pilot. Pilot drives the base, co-pilot drives everything else. We have a human player, our drive coach. Uh, we have had an adult drive coach most of our team's uh, career. We've had student drive coaches way back in the 2000s. Uh, we have three chief engineers, a software, mechanical, and electrical chief engineer. These are picked during the build season. These are the most, these are the experts in those subsystems. And they're the ones responsible at the event and at practice during the competition season for keeping the robot healthy. We have a technician. That technician is usually whichever one of the chief engineers is needed at the time for having mechanical problems with the intake. We'll send the chief engineer to just be able to be closer to the field, things like that. But normally it's the software chief engineer who will help set the driver station, make sure we have CAN connection, all these other things. Um, we have two strategic videographers. One has an iPad and uses the media badge down by the field. The other one sits in the stands and films a full field video. Another person records autonomous specifically, so we know about tuning. This is more of a thing in like 2022 where we were trying to get all five balls in autonomy and we're never able to do that. Uh, we have a scouting mentor who kind of just hangs out in the stands, uh, solves any issues, you know, if they need snacks, things like that, goes and gets snacks. Um, we have two scouting captains who are responsible for maintaining the scouting system, the database that we use. Uh, and also, they usually do data entry, sometimes they don't. Uh, and they're also responsible for pick list generation, things like that. We have, yeah, like I said, three data scouting entry. Uh, sometimes those are the scout captains. This past year, we had 12 scouts, two per robot. Uh, 1678 has three per robot. Uh, and this obviously depends on how big your team is. Most teams can't don't have the students to put that many uh, students on the scouting. Uh, for us, we have one student watches the match and audibly calls out what a robot's doing, and another person writes things down. Especially in these, the robots are getting faster and faster. It's a lot harder for one person to both watch and write down what's what's going on. Uh, we do three to six scouts collecting MVP data. So what we do, this is kind of our tiebreaker thing when we're doing our, our pick list is we're just like, who's the most valuable robot on that alliance? And we just tally up how many, how many times that team was the MVP of the alliance. We have two people who do pit scouting, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But we, it's just collecting technical data on teams' robots. We don't ask teams, you know. How many game pieces can you score? Where do you score? Things like that. We get that data by our match scouting. We have two, three strategists who help develop match strategy and feed it to the drive coach. We have someone who counts game pieces, and we uh, record that on a whiteboard in our pit. Every match, how many game pieces we've scored in auto and teleop. It helps us keep track directly as the pit crew and as the, uh, the flight crew. Uh, we do event media people who film for our recap videos. We have our impact mentor and three impact presenters at events we're presenting at. Uh, pit boss, that's me at events. Basically, that just means I drive the truck there, and I don't really do much else because the students do everything. Uh, we usually have two to three pit crew members in addition to the, tech, the chief engineers that rotate out. Um, and we try to get as many students' experience in the pit as possible. We have an R cube mentor. Ro R cubed is Robonauts Robot Rescue. It's kind of like Citrus uh, Service or Cheesy Cares. Uh, we just help teams fix their robots. We'll ask the inspector, hey, you have any teams that are struggling to pass inspection, need bumpers built? It's mostly building bumpers and uh, doing some wiring stuff. 
or uh, helping teams get code on the robot that uh, to, so that they can play matches. And then we'll have six to 10 students doing that. We'll have some people in our pit that's responsible for talking to judges. Usually our pit crew will do this, but sometimes when the robot's broken, we need someone else to, to handle that. We have a logistics mentor, software mentor, Auton mentor. And for eliminations, one of our mentors will help assist the third robot. And the last thing, um, we, some years we have a flipboard strategist where we'll have someone in the stands with this big flipboard counting things and the drive, the flight crew can see that on the field and it's a form of non-electronic wireless communication that is legal. Uh, it, it makes sense in some games, it doesn't make sense in some others. In 2018, we used it to count cubes on the far side of the field on the switch. Uh, in 2017, it was the number of ball points we needed to offset all sorts of things to, to be able to win the match. Uh, and it's it's not relevant for every single game. Uh, pit scouting, in 2023, we collected just technical things on the robot. Drive train type, width, that was important for getting on three robots on the charge station. Swerve module type and motor type, this is only useful for when it comes to alliance selection, knowing you know we, we carry a bunch of Falcons and Neos and SDS modules of what we have spares of that we could possibly use to help them out. Um, and we'll usually ask them if they've had any CAN or communications issues throughout the season. Uh, the match scouting is all about qu uh, quantitative data. I think it says qualitative data, but it's, it's quantitative data. Um, and they're responsible for making the data easy to understand by the uh, drive team and by the rest of the team when we're doing the pick list. And we'll scout practice matches if possible. If there's enough practice matches at the event, we'll do that and that'll feed into our early match uh, strategy. So we also identify any teams that have any comm issues, and uh, we'll let some of our CUBE students know, hey, if you want to go up to those teams and ask them if they need help, if they don't need help, we'll go away. If they want help, which is usually the case, we'll, we'll get some people who are experts in that system to uh, help them out. And identify any field issues, you know, oh, this charge station jams this way if you hit it this way. Uh, let's try not to do that. The flight crew is responsible for executing the match strategy, responsible for representing the team in a positive manner, and is not responsible for working on the robot. Uh, our drivers do not work on the robot. If your team is smaller, you may not have this luxury, but we do not want them to have to worry about, oh, I just broke the robot in a match, now I gotta go fix it. Uh, they're supposed to drive the robot. If they break it, we, we fix it in the pit, and it's not really a concern of theirs. And they usually do sit around and watch matches whenever there's downtime. Uh, kind of our event flow, we load in, pit boss handles the truck, the logistics mentor will check the team in, and then we'll try to get the robot straight to inspection. It doesn't even go to our pit. We, we take some time to set up our pit now, as it's big and stuff. But um, our electrical chief engineer will flash both the primary and backup radios for the event. We always have two radios, and that backup radio lives on the cart in case any sort of issue happens. Uh, our cube is usually going straight to building bumpers for teams that showed up with no bumpers. Um, and sometimes we're building entire robots with these teams. Um, and then the scouts try to figure out where we want to sit. And our pit scouts will start walking around collecting data that we uh, that I just talked about in that other slide. Uh, first day of matches, the pit crew, we try to be the first ones on the practice field. And usually it's not necessarily to practice any particular thing. It's just getting the driver's stick time after they've slept and whatever. We don't want the first time for them to drive the robot to be on the field in their first match. This is also why we have FRC carpet in our pit most of the time. Sometimes if we can't get to the practice field, at least they can drive around in our like eight by eight space. Um, so our scouts get set up in the stands, the videographers will figure out where they're gonna film from, our impact mentor will figure out when we're presenting and try to find a place quiet in the venue for them to practice. So they'll literally just run through the whole presentation over and over and over and over. Um, so during field calibration, the software crew will usually take the robot out there, calibrate limelight, figure out any other measurements we need, and the drivers will walk the field. The drivers hate when the carpet's all bunched up, and they're always like trying to find where that is, and you know, is it on the part the part of the field where we need to pick up a cone? Especially this year, we had a dustpan intake, so we need a really flat carpet. Oh, oh you did a great job, Joe. Uh, so they'll, they'll identify issues with that, if the carpet's messed up, things like that. And then some events will allow the human player to practice during field calibration, some events won't. So if they do, you can send them out there, throw some cones, do whatever. Um, and then we continue to have our cube uh, work with teams to help solve problems, path inspection, things like that. 
Uh, practice matches. So the uh, pit crew will hand off the robot to the flight crew. We always tell the flight crew, hey, this is what's wrong with the robot. You know, we fix this. We try, we change this just so they're aware of any issues. Hopefully the robot just works, but uh, sometimes there's stuff we can't fix in time. Uh, we try to be the first in line for practice matches, especially at districts where you may only get one filler line match at most. Um, at regionals, you have there's a lot more opportunities to play in practice matches. Um, so our strategic videographer, one will be filming close up to the field of just our robot. So they're only focused on our robot. And then we have the person in the stands filming full field video. And then our Auton person will film the Autons and, you know, oh, we, we missed it by two inches. Let's go change this. And they work directly with the software crew. And uh, sometimes you, we'll film behind the glass on phones and things like that just in practice matches. Don't do it in real matches. So pre-match, before any match, uh, practice match, uh, Elim's match, Qual's match, things like that, the pit crew runs a full functional to identify any issues on the robot. Um, and a lot of things, a lot of times we'll catch stuff that we didn't even know was broken. You know, a mechanism we don't use that often. Uh, we somehow broke it during a match. Um, this is performed when the robot returns to the pit from a match. And it's performed right before it leaves for the next match. So it'll run the first one on the battery uh, that it just competed the match in. And uh, we'll replace the battery, run the full functional on the competition battery for the next match, and then turn the robot off, and it'll just sit there. We try not to touch the robot if we don't have to. You know, you, so you start messing with stuff and that you didn't need to mess with. You pull out some connectors, and um, anytime we touch the robot, even if we've already done the outgoing full functional, we'll do it again because we may have broken something. Uh, the pit crew also makes sure we have a spare battery on the cart for us and a spare battery for our partner. Those are different because we use the big SB120 connectors and most teams don't. Um, the pit crew does the handoff to the flight crew, lets them know of any issues. Um, I will usually help make sure that our alliance partners show up for the match, no matter how... They, it seemed how well they had everything together. Sometimes teams will just, oh, we're competing? Like, when? Oh, like in two minutes? Yeah, you should be on the field now. Um, and then same thing, RQ will be helping teams with any issues, and especially any teams we've identified through our scouting that have had comm drops or uh, CAN bus issues, things like that. If it's anything other than the battery fell out, we're, we probably will go help them. The battery ones, you know, they usually learn that lesson pretty quickly. Uh, so pre-match on the strategy. So... The strategy crew will bring their ideal strategy down to the flight crew and our drive coach, and they'll have all the scouting sheets from this team from the entire event um, with everything marked up on there. And we also have a sheet that's uh, created by our database that says, you know, this is predicted score, things like that. And uh, this is a board from probably IRI this year. So what we have is on the left is the Auton board. On the right is the full match board. So we're showing what, who's doing what in Auton. We're running the center Auton like we always do. And then these are our lanes. You know, 118 is only allowed to pick up from there. 195 is only allowed to pick up from the right double substation. That leaves 245 a, a clear path in there. This is really important, especially in a game like this where the lanes are, are critical to match flow. If you get in each other's way, stuff gets messed up really, really quickly. Now, uh, the other thing we have on here uh, and this is the only thing really the drivers see is those numbers, the number of game pieces we expect each robot to contribute. Um, the drivers will look at the sheets if they need to, but they're usually only if they want to be involved in strategy or they involved in strategy. Um, so like Corsetto said in his uh, talk, the flight crew will go find the alliance partners, ask them. We always ask them what they want to do first. You know, we're not, we don't want to come in and say, this is the strategy. And most of the times, what a team wants to do is what we go with. Because asking a team, especially if you're like asking a team that plays offense most of the time to play defense, it's usually going to be detrimental. You know, asking them to do something that they're not comfortable with um, is always a, a risk. And this year's game, particularly triple offense, seemed to always be the right answer for us. In some years, like in 2019, especially out of Arizona, we would play matches where we were the only offensive robot and the other two robots were playing defense, keeping us uh, protected from defense from the opponent alliance. Maybe that's because we had an H drive and we really need to be protected, but um, you know, it worked out in that game. Uh, we've kind of come to the conclusion that we really don't like asking teams to do stuff that they don't really want to do. Um, and it's, it's worked out for us this past couple seasons. And you have to try to optimize the alliance score, not your score. You may take a hit in your scoring, but 
if it allow if you are one game piece less uh, on your robot, but the other two robots are two game pieces higher, then that's the right thing to be doing. Um, you know, if, if you're if you're trying to optimize your score to look better in um, in scouting that other teams are doing, that's fair. But you know, looking good as far as the flow of a match and being able to execute a clean match with other robots, we we see that and we take that data more into account than you know. Oh, you were one game piece less. And then the flight crew goes to Q, and our goal is to be the first line, the first robot there. Uh, help our alliance get there. Make sure if they have any issues, we fix it. We got zip ties, the tape, things like that to make quick repairs. Like I said, we carry extra batteries um, in case they need them. Uh, so during the match, they're there to execute the strategy. The um, drive coach has to make calls when things go wrong. So we'll sometimes uh, talk strategy with the drive coach on you know this team's had issues. If they die, you know where are we going to push them out? We don't want them blocking the community, things like that. Uh, the co-pilot is the driver responsible for knowing all the backup functions on the robot. So we have a whole button pad with a bunch of extra stuff that can reset Canivore, reset um, network switches, things like that. We run a low voltage, a custom low voltage uh, PDU on the robots. So we can power cycle a lot of those things. Um, you know, In 2019, we had functions to shut off our upper pneumatic system if there was a leak, things like that. And it's their responsibility to know how to use all those. We'll do some practice at home saying, oh, this thing's failed. What are you going to do? And the first time, every, anytime there's a robot issue and the robot comes back, it's always everyone's asking, did you press that button? Did you press that button? And like, no, we didn't press that button. We're like, come on. Like, that, that's what you needed to do to fix the robot. Um, this one is a, I don't know, it gets you like an extra couple seconds in a match. So you can pick up the controllers when the timer hits zero, not when the buzzer sounds. A lot of times the buzzer sound is delayed from the actual match timer. So a lot of times we'll have an extra second or two we get to drive a robot than most teams who do not know this. Um, and for us, the drive coach uh, ideally coaches the whole alliance and can help make audible calls. Oh, 118 tipped over. Now I'm going to go coach these other teams. Y'all have to get on the charge station. We got to get that ranking point, things like that. Um, early in the season, uh, we'll usually have a little bit more our drive coaches coaching our team but we try to get away from that as much as we can. So the videographers are recording the match on iPads. Uh, we have our two scouts per robot. One calls out the moves um, and scoring, and the other one writes down everything on our scouting sheet. And then we have our MVP scouters determining who the MVP of the Alliance is. And then our pet crew just stares at the robot and makes sure nothing breaks. I, you know, I, I have seen so few matches this season of other teams' robots because I'm always laser focus on ours you're like man that intake didn't look very good what's going on there all oh, do we skip a belt tooth one two things like that um post match so the flight crew takes the robot off the field we don't turn it off some people don't like that um and especially if there was a software issue so if there was a software bug we want the robot to come back to the pit in the exact same uh state it was on the field in uh so the flight crew hand off the robot to the pit crew and we talk about any issues we'll go through Drivetrain, drivetrain's good, intake, intake was good, uh, cameras, oh, we didn't use it, so we don't know if it was good. Um, and then the flight crew will go to a quiet corner of the venue to do a debrief, and the strategy crew will join them. So we'll watch the 118 specific close-up video and critique robot moves, be like, oh, you should have gone for that game piece, you should have gone for that game piece. And our drivers are really good at accepting criticism, especially it, it helps that it's in a small group. So we, we protect our drivers through the drive coach from criticism from the whole team. So... No, no one else on the team is supposed to come up to the driver and be like, man, you, that, that match sucked. Like, you should have done this. You should have, like, that's just, it's not the way to do it. It's, it's just unnecessary. And it, again, it's a, it's a psychology thing. So we'll also watch the full field video to see how the coordination amongst the Alliance worked out, especially in a cycling game like this where you have to have clear lanes and not getting in each other's way. Um, and sometimes we'll try new things. We'll be like, oh, that didn't work. Oh, cube shooting over the charge station. That worked awesome. Let's keep doing that. And then we'll discuss with the strategist how that worked. Uh, and also, we, we talk about the human player's performance. So we're like, hey, you got to start getting cones further out. You know, you, you got these cones in the way of this other team. So the human player is a critical part in some games, especially this game, of the performance on the field. And so scouters will also input the match data from the previous match into our database. And then they'll start putting the package together for the next match. They'll, put, they'll take the folders back, put all the old sheets away in our filing system, get all the new sheets for the next match all ready to give to our flight crew. Um, 
and then we'll go on to the next match. So the pit crew, uh, we perform a full functional, like I said, um, on the battery it just played on. If anything broke, that subsystem specialist will come to the pit to help fix it. And it's it's really easy to you know the intake came off in a million pieces. Let's start getting to work on that. We don't do that. We have we run a full functional to make sure that you know the intake falling off didn't also break the drivetrain and everything else because it's really easy to get focused on fixing this one mechanism and then you go into the match and you have all sorts of other issues, especially with a CAN bus system. Um, so we also do regular maintenance, grease the gears, replace tread, cleaning intake rollers is a big thing. I think a, a lot of people don't you know do that. So we make sure that all our intake rollers are nice and clean with IPA, make sure that they're, um, they're nice and sticky. So, and then the robot, if there's nothing else to do, it'll sit there um, until it's ready to perform the exit full functional. We'll try not to touch it. Sometimes, you know, someone will come up like, hey, what's on your intake? We'll be like, oh, we'll show you. And then hopefully we didn't break anything doing that. But uh, then we'll do the exit full functional before it goes to the ne next match. And like I say here, don't mess with things that aren't broken. We, 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 we tinker and it sucks. And we're like, why did we do this? Like, we're trying to get like a very small percentage points of efficiency out of it, and it broke everything. So, uh, so we'll sometimes go to the practice field if we need to. It's really hard at district events with three match turnarounds, five match turnarounds. Um, but at regionals, we're able to do it. And when there's pit crew downtime, we'll work to prepare spares for the robot, especially for intake rollers this year and things like that, and spare wheels for the square drive. You may ask, why don't you prepare them at home? Well, we competed five weeks in a row and we were never at home. So that we were manufacturing stuff in our pit. Uh, so, you know, then it comes to pick list time. So we are fortunate to generally be in a picking position. Sometimes we're not at IRI. We were not in that case. But at IRI, we had seven different pick lists. So depending on whatever scenario played out with, with who picked us. So you should definitely have a pick list wherever you are because... If you get picked, you can help contribute to the Alliance captain. And, and you know, there's a lot of times you may get picked by a team that has no scouting data. And they're like, oh, thank God you scouted because we don't have anything. Um, so at our scouting meeting, it's held the night before the last day of the event. Uh, if it's championships, we'll try to do a joint scouting meeting if we know who we're going to play with. So we did that um, this year. Uh, scouting captains lead the meeting. The whole team's free to come and give input. So even if you didn't scout a single match of the event, which most of our students do scout matches, um, you're free to come and give input. And the drive team will sometimes be there. They'll say, you know, that team was hard to work with, this and that. Uh, we don't really want to play with them. And we'll decide what we need from a first and second pick. And these are usually different things. Uh, then it's not always, you know, pick the hot, best, most amount of game pieces you can score with this robot. And when you get down there, also pick the most amount of game pieces they can score. A lot of times it's like, oh, we need this auton out of them, or we need this, or they need to be this narrow to fit for a triple balance in this past year. Uh, so yeah, we'll determine if we need different pick lists for different scenarios. IRI, we had seven pick lists. Um, usually we don't have that many, but it depends on how things play out, especially at championships. And so we'll run the initial sort in our Excel spreadsheet. The first pick is usually an easy decision. Sometimes it'll come down to, you know, we're like, we're really close between these two teams. And then on the next day, the next morning, we'll go ask the team, hey, can you, can you run this auton on the practice field? We want to see this. Can you do this, and that, that'll that help influence our decision. Uh, so the, the big thing we do is, especially for the third robot, we're sorting and we'll say, okay, this team versus this team. And we'll look, we'll be like, oh, they score one in Auton, they score 0.7 in Auton, they score 3.5 in, in Teleop this. Oh, but this robot's way narrower. So we move them up so that, because they're easier to fit on a charge station, things like that. And if there's really, really close ties between them, like, I don't know, we'll look at the MVP data and be like, well, they were the MVP two times and this team was never an MVP at all. Um, so we also will move teams up and down the next morning because uh, it we still have matches to play. Some teams may have issues the next day and we'll move them down the pick list. And next thing, alliance selection. So for alliance selection, we'll send our scouting captain or our team captain. Usually it's a senior. So sometimes it's the scouting captain. Sometimes it's just whoever wants to go down there. And they'll go down there with the pick lists, and we usually only use it for the first pick. So things change; they're so dynamic with alliance selection that we can't really have a pick a pick list that goes all the way down that they can go off with no in a vacuum with no data from who else who everyone else picked. Uh, so, 
after we are picked or after we make our first pick, we'll go find that team's scouts and strategists in the stands. We'll all work together, uh, collaborate on who we think we should pick, take in their data, take in our data. Um, and we'll do what lots of teams do and write the third robot who we want to pick on a whiteboard, show it to them. It's a lot easier than texting or picking a phone call when there's no cell service. Um, and then right after that, we get all the drive teams together. Usually there's a field meeting where all the Alliance captains have to meet, but we'll get all the drive teams together, uh, talk about, is there anything we need to know? Like, did your robot just explode right before we picked you? Like, is there anything that, that we need to know about? And, you know, are you cool playing the strategy that we think we should run through the elimination bracket? Uh, you know, if possible, this is so this often is during lunch. So, of course, Edo talked about this as well. Um, you manage to make sure that your drive team is eating and getting water and things like that. So, uh, if there is a time of downtime to be able to for them to go get food, great. If not, we usually try to bring the food to them. Depends on venue rules and things like that. Um, and as soon as the second pay, pick is made, me and the, uh, one of our mentors will help uh, with the third robot, go straight to that team's pit. Like, is there any problems you have? Is there anything you need help with? And a big one is how many batteries do you have? So if you only have two batteries, it's a really tough ELIMS bracket. So we'll, we'll bring them a charger. We'll bring them batteries that we have. And they don't have to be perfect batteries. So they don't have to be brand new batteries usually. Um, and offer them if they need any help. Oh, yeah, we have this, this intake motor keeps cutting in and out. We're like, oh, okay, let's, we'll get some of our students over here who are, know how to fix can issues, things like that, fix connectors, and, and help them out. And that third robot mentor is there usually to help guide them to the field when, on time because it's a really intense playoff racket. Things are moving really, really fast. If you've never played in a playoff racket before, um, you know, there's a lot you don't know. There's like, oh, I didn't even know I was supposed to be there. Oh, I didn't know I need to do this. So that's just, they're just there to help them out and inform them um, on things like that. And then if we need to coordinate anything to get the whole alliance, uh, for the whole alliance, we'll get them on the practice field as soon as possible. We did this at uh, Magnolia this year and at the state championship, trying to get triple balances figured out. Um, some games it's more important, some games it's not. Um, but, uh, and it's the practice fields, some events they'll close, some events they won't. Um, and it's usually a rush to get on the practice field. So trying to be there as soon as possible, increase your chances of actually getting to practice. And then we have the playoff bracket. So most of our processes are the exact same, just the turnaround is quicker. Um, some events will allow you to move your pit closer to the field for playoffs. Um, we don't do this because our pit's too big, but our robot cart kind of becomes our, our playoff pit. We only just have to run back and forth for batteries, which is not, not that big of a deal. Uh, managing batteries of the whole alliance, making sure that uh, you're running, you know, you're, you're keeping your best batteries for the finals matches. You're not, ideally, you shouldn't reuse a battery during a playoff bracket. Um, if you have to, if you don't have enough batteries, there's plenty of teams will likely let you borrow some, especially if they're not in the playoff bracket. Um, stay calm, stay hydrated. It's easy to just be focused on that and not pay attention to everything else. Um, and then, like I kind of said earlier, the pit boss and the third robot mentor will help the alliance partners keep up with the pace of the playoff bracket and provide support with needed. You know, something will break. We'll be like, oh, we got heck chef, and saw, things like that, um, and help them get stuff fixed. And that's kind of it for, for how we run events. So anyone have any questions? You're a pilot, a co-pilot. Do you usually run the pilot does everything? Uh, so the pilot is as little as possible. So it's the drivetrain for sure, and oftentimes it's the intake for picking up game pieces. And usually the co-pilot will run everything else. Some teams will build robots that are simple enough that uh, one, one person can drive the whole robot, or that it has so much autonomy that one person can drive it. Uh, we don't, we shoot ourselves in the foot every year and build complicated robots, so we kind of have to have two people to do that. Um, but we try to offload as much of the base drive, off the base driver as possible. Their job is to, Get the robot across the field to pick up game pieces, score game pieces, and not look at much else. The co-pilot will look out across the field and try to say, oh, we should go to that game piece next. Oh, we're, this team's coming to play defense on us. And they're kind of a, a little drive coach. You know, They're not looking able to look at the whole alliance as far as like a normal drive coach can, but they're able to look at our robot's performance and figure out where we need to go to do these things. And oftentimes, they're the ones making the call for coming back for in-game, like parking, things like that. Yes. Um, you know how important scouting is uh, to try to communicate the effects of it in the alliance selection. 
but we still get feedback from our students that uh, after three months of working hard, the robot is a little bit uh, opposite reward, uh, disincentive to go to competition and then be filling out that entry all weekend. So, what what uh, techniques do you have to, to get people more interested in scouting or, or make their jobs work the best work? Yeah, so we we do, we rotate scouts. So if you have enough students and you're able to do this, that's great. We try not to have anyone scouting for more than two or three hours in a row. It's just it's a lot to sit in the stands for any amount of time. So if you have the ability to rotate them out, that that helps. And we also kind of try to lead by example. We'll have mentor like mentors will scout. We'll show that it's important that the team is scouting. It's like oh well, if the mentors are scouting, then it's got to be important to be doing. And, you know, we're a flat organization is what we say. There's nothing the students can't do. There's nothing the mentors can't do uh, as far as uh, roles on the team. Obviously, mentors can't drive the robot, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll do that some years. And, you know, we have the benefit of it just pointing to history and being like, look, these, uh, these banners came from the scouting. You know, uh, it, it's, it's a big deal. And um, we're trying, we kind of, we struggle with it too. You know, we have 66 students and, even doing the rotation, some of them are like, don't want to scout, or we struggle to get accurate data sometimes. Um, and that, you know, we'd rather have them not scout than just have inaccurate data. And we've been trying to figure out, you know, things we get to do to incentivize it. We haven't really, you know, tried anything out yet, but make sure there's snacks up there. You know, if the event allows for it, snacks, water, you know, a, a $10 box of chips at Costco goes a long way of keeping students happy in the stands. So, yes. Uh, no, so we have a spreadsheet or we have a piece of sheet, a sheet on a clipboard um, and we just check things off. So the person who runs that is who drives the robot for that is not our drivers. They're not supposed to be working on the robot. They already have to do their debrief, things like that. It's usually either our backup drivers or our software chief engineer. And we'll go forward, backwards, left, right. They don't need the sheet by the end of the season. They have it all memorized and we'll record battery voltage, any changes we've made to the robot. But it's just a piece of paper where we check stuff off. And we've done that for years and years and years. Sometimes they give us trouble. And if you explain that your robots had issues and you need to diagnose it and you really would like it on, we'll usually let you keep it on. You gotta be nice. You gotta be tactful and professional and things like that. Yeah, so the pit crew will stand at the edge of the pit, the flight crew will stand right outside the pit, and we'll just usually um, the drive coach will say, you know, base, things, and then the, the drivers will give input on that. And then, you know, usually me and the drive coach will talk about plan of action, you know, oh, okay, we'll go get to the practice field as soon as we can, or we can, we'll do this. Um, and they'll go do their debrief, and we'll, we'll take care of it. Uh, we've never had an issue with that. So the rules allow you to pick up the controller when the timer hits zero. Alan, did you have something? Yes, yes. The, with the end of Auton hit zero. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we have a 3D printer in our pit. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we have bamboo labs now. Um, there's a Mark Forge there. The bamboo lab is useful. The Mark Forge is absolutely not useful because it takes too slow to, it takes too long to print. Um, but yeah, it's actually, so there's, there's a lathe and a 3D printer and it's almost always used by other teams. Yes. Um, do you guys have any rules about what age your drivers should be on? We don't have rules for that, but it's, it's possible that a freshman could be a driver. It is unlikely that they'll be a driver. Um, but we don't have a hard rule on that. Yes. You mentioned the topic, the primary criteria for choosing a flight crew is how they represent the team. Front and back up really briefly, but I wonder if you could provide more detail about what that actually means. They just have to be someone who uh, is professional, you know, will never say anything that negatively reflects on the team, things like that, that understand the core values, the history of the team, can answer a bunch of questions. Uh, we get lots of questions when it comes to the money thing, things like that. They have to have tactful answers for all of that. 
um, and sponsors and things like that. So that that's that's what that means. Yes. So that's another reason why it's often not freshmen. We have no data on a freshman on how, you know, how they are. So, you know, we may get a recommendation from one of their youth robotics team's mentors, but um, we'll just, you know, mentors will give input. You know, I worked with this student all season and they were awesome. And, you know, they did great talking to judges in the pit last year. And, you know, that, that's about it for that. Uh, we have a couple who have been with the team uh, that entire existence, uh, Bill Bluthman, Lucian Junkin. Um, a few of us are pretty new. You know, I'm 24. I've been with the team since I was a student. But uh, we've had a lot of rotation in the past few years with um, COVID. And there's a big project at work called Viper that a lot of the mentors are working on. And they just can't dedicate time to the team. But of all of our current mentors, um, only... Three of them have been with the team prior to 2018 as a mentor. Uh, there's not a selection process other than we do our school district background check and um, they got to register with first and do the YPP background checks as well. So there's not like a, you're not, you're not a good enough engineer to be a mentor that we don't have that. <laughs> The flight crew, it's their only job for the competition season. We very strongly believe that they should be heavily involved in building the robot. It's very easy for someone who, especially when we narrow down to a few drivers before the season, to just hang out in the corner and drive robots all day. But, you know, that's not a part. They're not being a part of the team in that case. So we really want them to uh, be contributing to prototyping, building, things like that. The pit crew, usually the three chief engineers, they're permanently in the pit. They're always in the pit. The others will rotate out throughout the season. We'll rotate a lot through early events and then for elims and for state champs and worlds it'll get narrow and narrow and narrow to those who are really really experts in those subsystems andy um i don't we don't get as much critique anymore i think the doing things to the community such as every bot stuff like that kind of his his Die that down, but you know that pit. All of this stuff is not parts for our robot. You know, we we bring a lot of stuff to events just to give out to whoever needs it. A lot of teams do this: sixteen seventy eight, two fifty four. And you know, when you interact with those teams directly and they have a positive experience with our team, that stuff t tends to just not stop. Those comments stop. That doesn't happen. Obviously, there's a lot of teams that we don't interact with from other parts of the world, things like that, and they may have those opinions of us. But the teams that interact with us locally, you know, we're helping out. We're building bumpers. We're like, oh, you need a motor here? Have this. You know, we're fortunate to be able to share our resources and afford to be able to just give away stuff like that to, to teams that need it. And that's kind of, you know, we don't have those sorts of comments as much anymore. You may see, you'll see them on YouTube, things like that, but. It's easy to type something online. It's a lot different when they interact with our students uh, at events. Yes. You said that you did your robot alone and you kind of had like software or that you're trying to do. We try not to. We will not make a, like an Auton software change unless we can go to the practice field to test it. No matter how confident we are that two inches, changing that number by two inches actually is two inches, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do it. Um, we, we would do it on a practice day or a practice field day because you're essentially just getting a bunch of practice field time. Um, but we definitely don't do it during ELIMS and we very rarely will change robot control code as well without practicing it. You know, we'll sometimes we'll say, oh, we want the arm to go faster. Okay, we'll double the value, but we got to go, you know, test it first, things like that. So we'll, we'll do that. Like the robot doesn't really sit alone very often because we're always working on it. But if we do have really have nothing to do, it does, it just sits there. Yes. Yeah, we'll run through the whole full functional in maybe 60, 70 seconds, and then they'll swap the battery. So in this past year, it was two bolts, take the battery out, get the zip tie on the connector, put the battery in, zip tie it back, bolt it back in, and then it's done. So, you know, the whole process is maybe three minutes. 
So it's it's definitely intense, especially Elam's matches, things like that, when things go wrong. And even if we're what's happening at IRI, we had a, a can coder dropped out in one of our matches and we fixed it, we fixed it, we fixed it. And we're like, they're like loading onto the field for our match and we got it fixed and we still ran the full functional because you know it's not it's not worth it if you got everything fixed and broke something else. And usually field staff are understanding and you know things like that but uh, yeah we run it every single match and in off seasons too even when it's you know a low stakes off season event even with when we're competing with our everybody in an off season event we do it it's a part of the culture of the team and and things like that yes so we have a booster club and usually three four of them will be at the event to support with with meals so we'll We'll take orders for meals in a Google Sheet the week before the event, and they'll they'll get stuff. They'll bring it to the event, and you know sometimes we have to eat outside. Sometimes you're allowed to bring food in, and and they support in that way. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, looks like we're a little over on time. <laughs>